you're looking to dive into topics on how to live a happier, healthier, more fit, and long lifespan, then you've come to the right podcast. Live in the dream with me, Coach Damian Evans. Together, we will explore the topics on all things health, fitness, and wellness. Together, we will be lifelong learners on this journey to living the ultimate dream. What up, dream team? Coach D here coming at you with a bite-sized brain snack. These episodes were inspired because of our obsession with snacks. We love to fuel our bodies with these little bite-sized nutritious foods. We've also talked about adding movement snacks into your day the same way. So we have food and we have movement covered, but what about our brains? It's time to add a little bit of bite-sized brain snack into your week. And that's what these episodes will be all about. Bite-sized wellness wisdom for lifelong learners. So let's open up and satiate our minds. This brain snack is all about the most irresistible, most sought after treat, the sweetest nectar ever created by man, sugar. And I'm thrilled to have you here today as we dive headfirst into a topic that is as sweet as it is sticky, cutting sugar, the sweet escape. You know, sugar can be as enticing as the first sip of your favorite soda. But it can also be as sneaky as that hidden candy stash that you have after Halloween. We've all been there, trying to resist that sweet temptation that seems to be lurking around every corner. But fear not, for today, we're going to arm you with nine practical and empowering tips to cut the sugar shackles and reclaim your health. But before we embark on this journey together, let's make one thing clear. I'm not here to be the sugar police. I love sugar just as much as anyone else. We're all about finding a balance and a sustainable approach to living our best lives. So, if you're ready to ditch the sugar crashes and bid farewell to the sugar roller coaster, then buckle up because we're about to dive into some life-changing tips. We're going to share an article that Levels, the continuous glucose monitor, just put out in their newsletter all about sugar. Sugar can be difficult to resist, even the most nutritionally savvy person. After all, we're all evolutionarily hardwired to enjoy and seek out sweet flavors. But with today's readily accessible, hyper-palatable, processed, sugary foods, regular intake of sweets can compromise a healthy lifestyle, especially as we are so sedentary these days. Sugar foods and refined carbs rapidly break down into glucose in the body, and this causes surges in blood sugar and insulin. Over the long term, high glucose variability can lead to insulin resistance. It can lead to dysregulated fasting blood sugar and an increased risk of metabolic diseases. And while yes, the body needs a certain amount of glucose to survive, we can get plenty glucose from breaking down the nutrient dense whole foods that we like to suggest to eat here on the podcast, like vegetables and fruits. Now, an obvious solution would be to just cut out all added sugar from your diet, right? But the reality is a lot more complex. Due to how ubiquitous sugar is in our diets, it's really hard to know whether you're eating this added sugar or not. It's really hard to know the nature of the ingrained habits that we've already put into our daily routines. And our neurological response to this sweet stuff is insane. It's like an addiction almost. Setting healthy boundaries with sugar and carbohydrates is possible, but trying to use willpower and quick fix cleanses aren't enough to set you up for long-term success. Coming up, we've tapped the expertise of top nutritionists for practical advice on what to eat, what to avoid, and what proven strategies can lead to successful reduction in sugar in your diet. But before we do that, what are the benefits of cutting out sugar? There are many perks to limiting sugar consumption. When we eat processed carbohydrates and excess amounts of sugar, our fasting blood sugar goes up over time. Limiting sugar can help curtail these risks and offer other benefits as illustrated in scientific research and clinical cases. And these include less insulin resistance and chronic disease, because chronically elevated blood sugar can lead to chronically elevated insulin, and eventually your cells are gonna become somewhat numb to insulin's effects. This is known as insulin resistance, and it can increase your blood triglycerides 
and your risk of heart disease, diabetes, fertility issues, and Alzheimer's. Another benefit of cutting sugar is if you're struggling with your body composition, you can cut sugar and it's easier weight loss and easier maintenance. Insulin is one of the body's key anabolic storage hormones. That means that it's a builder. So when it's repeatedly elevated due to a high carb, high sugar diet, it promotes the conversion of excess glucose to stored fat. And also it inhibits the burning of stored fat, making it harder to lose weight. Another benefit is better hormonal balance. High levels of insulin cause an elevation in androgens, which are the male sex hormones in women, which is associated with PCOS, the number one cause of female infertility. And in men, insulin resistance is associated with lower testosterone levels and increased risk of erectile dysfunction. So cutting out sugar, better hormonal balance, especially for the sex hormones. Also reduced joint pain. Excessive sugar intake is associated with increased levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is going to drive chronic inflammation and contribute to painful inflammatory joint conditions such as arthritis. When cutting sugar, you're also going to have a more stable mood, you're going to have better focus, and you're going to have less cravings. Crashing after a blood sugar high not only triggers cravings, it can make you irritable, tired, scattered, and unable to focus. Experts say that you also are going to have better skin, so healthier skin and less acne because high sugar intake is associated with acne while elevated blood sugar is associated with increased collagen glycation. So that just means when sugar uh, sticks to the collagen proteins causing them to cross link and just get stiffer, which can accelerate skin aging. And a huge benefit of cutting sugar out of your diet is you're going to have improved cardiovascular health and you're going to have improved brain health as well as improved mitochondrial function. These are all huge things, especially if you're someone that lacks energy, if you're always fatigued, like this is important stuff. So how to cut sugar from your diet? Let's talk game plan. The quote unquote ideal approach to cutting out sugar is definitely gonna vary from individual to individual, but there are definitely a number of methods that can be helpful. Here are is a little roadmap that could serve as a starting point for anyone that is looking to reduce or eliminate sugar from their diet. The foundational tenets of the plan are, number one, it's not just about sugar. Yes, sugary sodas, juices, desserts, and candies, those tend to cause the sharpest and highest increase in blood glucose. But other sources of carbohydrates, particularly refined grains like breads and crackers and pastas and cereals, those things that have been stripped of their fiber, these things can rapidly break down into glucose in the body and spike blood sugar as well. So it's not just about just thinking about sugar. Number two, take it slow and take it steady. In general, people are more likely to fail and experience more unpleasant symptoms when they go from a high baseline level of sugar and carbs to a drastic reduction in overall carbohydrate intake. So while it's perfectly fine to go out cold turkey on added sugar, refined grains, and potent sources of natural sugars like juices, we don't really advise going ultra low carb or eliminating starchier whole food carbs, at least not right away. Don't go cold turkey, no carb right away, especially if you're someone that already consumes a bunch. Gradually titrating down your sugar is often a smarter bet than going cold turkey. If life is really hectic, you can even tackle one part of your day at a time. For example, give yourself a week to optimize just your morning food intake, just your morning food, which is super important. It can impact your blood sugar for the rest of the day and put you on a sugary roller coaster energy ride if you don't do it correctly. And then after you get breakfast all set, then focus on your afternoon meals. And then finally, you can put into your evening meals once you get that step-by-step -step process down. Take it slow, take it steady. Number three, in the beginning, swap sugar and processed carbs for more nutritious options. If you're coming from a highly processed diet, I always coach clients to lean on light starches such as low glycemic berries, squashes, even starchier tubers like sweet potatoes to support this transition. And from there, you can further reduce your overall carb intake if you desire. 
Make sure that you prioritize protein. You probably need more than you think. Most people are averaging like 40 to 60 grams a day. Over 100 grams a day, depending on your weight, is a great goal to shoot for. And also fiber. Up to 30 to 50 grams per day is a really good goal. And healthy fats is also a must for promoting satiety, your hunger, and balanced blood sugar. So in the beginning, swap sugar and processed carbs for more nutritious options. And then uh, uh, number four, maintain these healthy habits long term. Maintain them long term, but allow for some flexibility. The goal of this plan is to get off this blood sugar roller coaster that often follows holidays or special events. And you have to retrain your palate to require less sweetness to be satisfied. You have to be able to do this to curb cravings and promote metabolic flexibility. And that requires consistency. But the goal isn't to never eat a cookie again. Once you've established a rhythm with this plan, you can occasionally reintroduce eliminated foods or dishes one at a time here and there for special occasions. And that's okay, especially if it's done with intention. Of course, if you choose to cut carbs and sugar cold turkey, it is possible, but really this is only advisable if you do so with the help of a nutritionist or a group or a partner who can be there to support and to help through any kind of symptoms such as low energy or intense cravings or fatigue or anything like that. What can you expect in the short term and in the long term when you're cutting out sugar? Well, after removing added sugars and refined carbohydrates from your diet, you may have several days where you feel super tired, you feel irritable, hungry, you have headaches. This is much more likely if you're a sugar burner and you're not metabolically flexible. Metabolic flexibility is when you can efficiently switch between burning predominantly glucose, blood sugar, and switch between that and predominantly burning fat as a source of fuel. But if you've consistently been spiking your blood sugar with a high carb, high sugar diet, even if only over the holiday seasons, this drives the release of insulin, which inhibits fat burning, meaning that it doesn't do fat burning as well. And it hampers your metabolic flexibility because your body is mainly burning glucose. That's what it knows how to do the best. Lowering sugar and lowering refined carbohydrates. This is the first step to becoming more metabolically flexible. Once you get over the initial hump, you should start to notice some really nice perks. Benefits that I've seen people experience within the first several weeks to months include improved energy, fewer cravings, less bloating, less acne on their skin, and a decrease in pain and inflammation. And of course, the longer you can keep at these healthy habits, the more likely they are to translate into long-term benefits like reduced risk of chronic disease. So let's dive into the nine actionable steps to cut out sugar, reset your palate, and support long-term health. Try to follow these tips for about four to eight weeks, one to two months, and you'll generally find that that is sufficient time to establish healthy habits, reset your taste buds, and curb your sugar cravings. So number one actionable step to cut out sugar is to eliminate added sugars and acellular carbs. We'll talk about acellular carbs in just a second. After a period of eating sweets and highly processed foods, a worthy goal for just about everyone is to cut out acellular carbs for a month or two. These are carbohydrates that have been broken out of their fiber cell and are easy to digest, and therefore they're more likely to spike your blood sugar. These carbs include refined sugars such as table sugar, high fructose corn syrup for sure, natural sugars and sweeteners such as honey and maple syrup, and then all those refined carbohydrates that we talked about such as white rice or anything made from flour like breads, crackers, cereals, pastas, and juices, as well as anything prepared containing these individual ingredients. So even if it's a food that has these ingredients in it, you want to look out for that. When you focus on eating whole, minimally processed foods, you naturally avoid most of these ingredients. Of course, whole foods like fruits and beans and sweet potatoes, they still contain carbohydrates and some natural sugars, but generally in lower quantities and often packaged along with fiber, which is gonna help slow the digestion and buffer subsequent blood sugar spikes. So if you consumed in moderation, and in the context of an overall nutritious diet, these other foods are less likely to send your blood sugar soaring. So they're okay, those things like fruits, beans, sweet potatoes, and other whole foods. 
Still, it's important to keep in mind that sneaky sources of added sugar can pop up in things like frozen vegetables, with sauces, with frozen meals, salad mixes, condiments, things like dressings, marinades, stir fry sauces. Prepared foods from the grocery store hot bar also may have sneaky things added into them. Things like that you would think were healthy, like dried fruits and, and nut mixes and, and non-dairy milks and flavored coffee and tea beverages, these all can have added sugars. And a lot of times they have weird names on their labels to kind of disguise that it is sugar being added into them. And so to avoid unintentionally spiking your blood sugar, get acquainted with the various names of added sugar and scan your ingredients list for these things. Things like glucose, sucrose, fructose, lactose, dextrose, and maltrose. The O-S-E at the end is really a good sign that it's going to be something that's containing sugar. Uh, other things like malt sugar, malt syrup, maltodextrin, so the word malt, uh, corn syrup, cane sugar, brown sugar, agave nectar, coconut sugar, honey, maple syrup, brown rice syrup, so anything that has syrup in it. Of course, anything that has sugar like beet sugar, um, molasses is even one, and then fruit juice concentrates. If something says fruit juice concentrates, that literally just means sugar. Should you cut out anything else? Well, depending on your goals, getting acellular carbs out could be the extent of what you need to eliminate during your sugar reset, and that could be beneficial, right? But if you find yourself using whole food carbs as a crutch, or you want to take a more significant step towards balancing your blood sugar and supporting your weight loss, then you might want to kick things up a notch. For example, after two weeks of acclimating to a life without those acellular carbs, maybe you can cut back on or eliminate carbohydrate dense whole foods such as starchy vegetables, high sugar fruits, whole grains and legumes, and instead focus on non starchy fiber rich picks. More on what to eat on that in just a second. Another option could be to only consume these carb-dense whole foods before or after a workout when they'll be used to fuel the activity that you're going to do or support your recovery. That could be a great strategy is to time your carbs around your physical activity. So number one is to eliminate added sugars and acellular carbs. Number two, focus on what you can eat, what you can eat, protein, fat, fiber, and the right carbs. It's so easy to dwell on what you can't eat or what you shouldn't eat, but do yourself a favor and put the main focus on what you're going to eat rather than what you're going to avoid. This is a really great mindful strategy. Overall, you want to formulate your meals and snacks with a variety of nutrient-dense whole foods that together provide protein, fat, and fiber. Really focus on protein, fat, and fiber, which can boost your satiety levels, keep your blood sugar stable, and reduce cravings for sugar. Here's how. Don't skimp on the protein. One thing that I really look for with clients when they're coming off sugar is a suboptimal protein intake. When we have a suboptimal protein intake, we're going to have cravings for sugar for sure. Not only is protein the most satisfying macronutrient, but it's going to support your blood sugar balance because it's digested slowly and little to none is converted to glucose. Now for most people, adequate protein looks anywhere between 0.7 grams of protein per pound of body weight up to one gram of protein per pound of body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, that's anywhere between 140 grams and 200 grams of protein a day. Yes, that's hard. Yes, that requires a strategy, but that's something that you should shoot for. Also, switch over to whole food carbohydrates. So while acellular carbs are a no-go, whole food carbs are a definite yes. With these foods, the sugar and starch is wrapped in the fibrous matrix, so your body needs to exert much more effort via chewing and the action of digestive enzymes just to break them down, minimizing blood sugar impact over a longer period of time. Great options here would include squash, sweet potato, beans, lentils, low glycemic berries, and other blood sugar friendly fruits such as apples pears. I love kiwis. I try to eat one or two kiwis a day and oranges. And yes, there's going to be some whole food carbs that you definitely want to eat in moderation. Uh, things like oats and quinoa and brown rice, 
Uh, tropical fruits like mango, papaya, pineapple, these things are more likely to elicit a blood sugar response and, and definitely should be eaten in smaller quantities, if at all, if you can. Uh, some people handle them differently. But always pair your carbs with a protein and a healthy fat. This is going to buffer a rise in your blood sugar, meaning it's going to help minimize that spike. And if you have the ability to, you can test your blood sugar with a finger prick glucose test, or you could invest, it's a pretty hefty investment, in a CGM that like Levels uh, offers a continuous glucose monitor that you can put onto your body and you can see live time over a two week period as to what your blood sugar is doing with every single food that you eat with all of your physical activity. It's pretty rad. I do a continuous glucose monitor at least three times a year. Uh, I try to do it quarterly and just to kind of calibrate what my body is doing because I know that my blood sugar spikes are going to be a lot different than someone else's so it's important to see what works for me. Uh, also finding satisfying replacements for your high carb favorites. If you love a good sandwich ditch the traditional bread and try another sandwich alternative. You could do um, a collard or a seaweed nori wrap. You could do something that's a little bit more sprouted bread rather than the the white Wonder Bread stuff. Uh, if you can't live without your morning cereal or your morning oatmeal, maybe opt for low-carb oatmeal alternatives like warm chia, flax, hemp pudding. Th those are all good options. And if you need your soda fix, there's other types of fizzy, just satisfying drink stand-ins that you can do. Uh, our household loves Topo Chico. Um, there's definitely um, stevia sweetened fizzy drinks that you can drink that are zero carbohydrate and just have the sweetener depending on what you believe in on that. Uh, there's definitely ways. You can do diet sodas. I know that there's a lot of uh, argument on the internet about that, but there's some diet sodas that you can do instead. Anything's better than nothing. Soda, you just have to get that out of your diet, man. Load up on fiber-rich vegetables and plants as well. Research has shown that people who eat an average of 35 grams of fiber per day have better blood sugar markers than people who average only 20. And better blood sugar control can translate into fewer sugar cravings. That's one reason why Levels experts recommend 30 to 50 grams of fiber per day, so make sure that you're getting plenty of the fiber-rich, non-starchy vegetables such as leafy greens, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, things of that nature. And also, you can focus on quality fat sources. The wrong fats like vegetable oil, soybean oil, corn oil, those may cause inflammation and cause insulin resistance. Not good. Always opt for high quality cooking oils. We all know the good one. We have the extra virgin olive oil. You could do avocado oil, butter, ghee, coconut oil. Those are the ones that you really want to try to opt for and embrace um, nutrient dense whole food sources of fats such as avocados, nuts, seeds, and fatty fish. So number two, focus on what you can eat, protein, fat, fiber, and the right carbs. Number three, pay special attention to your mornings. What and when you eat in the morning has the potential to drive your, your cravings throughout the day. When I'm trying to lower someone's fasting blood sugar, I always start by attacking the first third of the day and making sure that they break their fast with a blood sugar balancing meal. This prevents a blood sugar crash later in the day, which can cause subsequent low energy uh, cravings and overeating. These types of breakfasts includes things like an egg scramble with avocado. You could put veggies in there and sausage. You could do a tofu and veggie scramble. You could do chia pudding with protein powder. And another great option would be like Greek yogurt with nuts and berries. And don't wait too long to eat in the morning. While many intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding protocols may have you hold off your first meal until noon, that doesn't always work for some people's bodies. For some, waiting might contribute to low blood sugar and then cravings and then overeating later in the day. So if you're someone that's doing intermittent fasting and you find that you do have these really, really bad hunger cravings, then maybe intermittent fasting is not for you. For best results, experiment with breaking your fast at different times. For instance, one to four hours after waking. Try it one hour, try it two hours, three hours, four hours after waking, and just see what feels best. 
or consider shifting your fasting window to the evening. Fasting is a phenomenal way to lower fasting blood sugar and also increase insulin sensitivity over time. And I've heard a lot of people have a lot more success with their fasting window when they stop eating at like 5 or 6 p.m. So they stop eating a little bit earlier instead of fasting through the morning. And that could help a lot of people. So maybe play with your fasting window. Pay special attention to your mornings. Number four, keep flavors interesting and keep meal prep simple. When you're used to sugary, hyper palatable processed foods, scaling back can feel boring and hard to sustain. So you need to find a way to tantalize your taste buds for minimal effort. If it's not fun and it's not delicious, you're going to get bored of it and this is not going to help you. But this is also not the time to spend six hours meal prepping on the weekend. Instead, do what we call meal prep light. Make a large piece of protein or some easy to go options. A nice piece of salmon, chicken thighs or tenders, hard boiled eggs, and grain free meatballs are all great ideas. Rinse and chop your vegetables so that they're easier to use throughout the week. Whether that's for a roasting tray or for the topping of a salad, just make sure that they're easy to grab. Use frozen veggies too. You can spread frozen broccoli and cauliflower on a sheet pan and heat them in the oven for 10 minutes. Let the uh, water evaporate and then toss them in oil, season them, and then pop them back in the oven. They'll taste fresh and roasted. Really good. You could also make one or two delicious dressings or dips per week. Put garlic tahini, chimchurri, red pepper hummus, cilantro pesto, and slather that on eggs, vegetables, salads, and proteins to instantly up the flavor factor and it could be a really easy quick dressing. When you sit down to eat, add some texture and crunch uh, plus a dose of fiber and healthy fats just by sprinkling some chia seeds on it, uh, basil seeds, pumpkin seeds, or walnuts into your meal. If you could crush up some walnuts, that always adds a nice little crunch. Number five, use certain sweeteners as desired. You can use natural non-caloric sweeteners like monk fruit and stevia to ease the transition and scale back your sugar, but just do so mindfully and gradually reduce the quantity that you do so with so that you can curb your compulsion for sweet flavors. It's not just about not having the sugar, it's about trying to get rid of that compulsion for sweet flavors. My preference is for monk fruit because it tastes a bit more like sugar than stevia does, and adding these sweeteners should be used sparingly, like once or twice a day. This might mean that you're using them in your morning coffee and tea, or you're consuming them in the form of monk fruit sweetened chocolate, um, or stevia sweetened soda. Just try to avoid artificial sweeteners with, if you can. There's a, there's a mixed research on these. Uh, artificial sweeteners may have been linked to metabolic consequences and some types of cancer, but that's really that's being argued and a lot of people are saying that's not true but who knows we're still in this learning phase we are all the live experiment right now so number five use certain sweeteners as desired number six prioritize sleep to boost results i feel like sleep is on every list we do you may have an easier time keeping sweet cravings in check and blood sugar balanced if you're well rested so aim for those high quality hours of sleep per night Seven to nine hours is what they say is the average person, but do what works best for you. Uh, in one study, participants increased hunger, sleepiness, and food cravings after a night of partial sleep deprivation compared to a night of optimal sleep. They also consumed more chocolate and selected larger portion sizes for lunch the following day, suggesting that inadequate sleep can promote consumption of sugary foods or overeating. One potential mechanism would be that inadequate sleep may lead to elevated levels of ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone that can increase a person's preference for sweet and fatty foods. And what's more, another study found that a single night of poor sleep can result in insulin sensitivity the next day. Just one night of poor sleep. That's the same as someone with metabolic syndrome, meaning after one night bad of bad sleep, it's harder to keep your blood sugar in a healthy range. So number six, prioritize sleep. Number seven, troubleshoot cravings 
headaches, and other sugar withdrawal symptoms. If you're feeling pretty crappy when you cut out sugar and refine carbs, it's, it's definitely a thing that has been seen. Consider these strategies in addition to prioritizing your sleep. Replace your electrolytes. Because as you eat fewer sweets and your insulin levels go down, you may be losing more sodium and minerals in your urine. And this can lead to a body that's tired. Uh, it can lead you with headaches, muscle cramps. Uh, insulin normally acts on the kidneys to promote sodium reabsorption. So if the insulin levels are low, more sodium will be excreted, which can alter levels of electrolytes. So to avoid this, she suggests seasoning your food with salt, or getting minerals via protein-rich foods or fresh produce. Or you could consider a sugar-free electrolyte powder that we use uh, called LMNT. LMNT, a uh, great product. We've used it for a long time. We really support the people that are uh, making it. It's, a, it's convenient. It is a little expensive. And on their website, they show you ways that you can make your own electrolyte mixes. So if you want to just go to drinklmnt.com, you'll see uh, either their product or their suggestions for at-home mixes. And then also try MCTs or exogenous ketones. As mentioned before, if someone goes cold turkey and cuts way back on their overall carb intake, but they're not yet there metabolically, if they're not yet metabolically flexible, meaning that they're still a sugar burner and not able to efficiently switch between burning glucose and fat, well then they are probably gonna experience fatigue, irritability, increased hunger, and headaches if they do it too fast. And in these cases, sometimes it's recommended to use MCT oil or beta hydroxybutyrate, which is just another word for an exogenous ketone. You could do this in the morning before your workouts. And the last hack, if you are feeling pretty crappy when you cut your sugars, is you could embrace apple cider vinegar and fermented vegetables. You could try snacking on pickles. You could add fermented veggies like sauerkraut to your next salad or scramble or sweet potato, or you could sip on diluted apple cider vinegar before your meals. When consumed before or with a meal, the organic acids in these foods can help reduce post-meal blood sugar spikes and increase feelings of satiety, hunger, which might help curb your desire to reach for something sweet afterwards. So try snacking on pickles, fermented veggies, sauerkraut, uh, apple cider vinegar before or during your meal if you are someone that's not feeling great. Number eight. You could use a continuous glucose monitor to optimize health benefits while gaining flexibility. All of the benefits of a plan like this can be enhanced even further when you use a continuous glucose monitor. For example, different people can have highly variable glucose responses to the same exact food. But a CGM can tell you more or less what are the best foods for you. So that could be a, another good one. Or you could do finger prick tests every once in a while. It just gets painful and it gets expensive. So. Uh, either way, it's a little bit of an investment. And lastly, number nine on our nine practical tips for cutting sugar are if you want to reintroduce an eliminated food, you have to do it with intention. After about four to eight weeks of low sugar and carb intake, you should be feeling pretty good with fewer symptoms and cravings and greater ease making healthier choices around food. And while you can keep up this way of eating for the long term if you want to, it's also okay if you occasionally consume some of the foods that you've eliminated. Say once a week or on a special occasion, whatever the frequency that works best for you and your goals and doesn't lead to a loss of control or put you back on a roller coaster, a blood sugar roller coaster, or a weight gain roller coaster. Just make sure that these foods are mixed with the macronutrients that support it. So not just sugars, but also proteins and fats. In other words, have these foods one at a time and with a meal. So you're not compounding thing after thing after thing, and you're not eating it alone, like you're having pancakes and then muffins and then cereal and then breads. You're doing it with a whole balanced meal. That could mean having a slice of whole grain toast with your scrambled eggs, avocado, and vegetables. Enjoy a serving of pasta with a veggie-loaded bolognese. Or savoring a small homemade cookie or brownie, my grandma always made those brownies, within 5 to 10 minutes of a meal just before you walk. So those are nine 
practical tips for cutting sugar and cutting sugar from your life isn't just about shedding a few pounds or checking off another diet trend on the list. It's really a journey of self-discovery, self-care, and reclaiming your health and vitality. So embrace these nine practical tips with excitement and determination and really knowing that each small step that you take brings you closer to a brighter, more energized, and more empowered version of yourself. Remember, you have the strength to overcome any challenge, and I have complete faith in your ability to succeed. I've seen this happen, and I know you can do it. So let's do this. Let's rise together, support one another, and embark on this sugar-free adventure because you are worth it, and you deserve the absolute best in life. Keep pushing forward, keep believing in yourself, and let's make this journey one for the books. Stay motivated, stay focused, and always remember that your wellness journey is about progress. It's not about perfection. I believe in you, and I can't wait to hear about the incredible transformations that you encounter while going after these nine tips. And that's it, my friends, for this bite-sized brain snack. Share the knowledge that you gained with your friends and family and hold each other accountable. If you enjoyed this content, it helps a ton. If you could post on your social media stories a screenshot of this episode with one takeaway that you learned, and also make sure that you tag me and share your journey. You can tag me at livingthedream underscore podcast or at coachdamian underscore SD. And let us know how this episode benefited you. Let us know what we missed. Let us know what we got wrong. And tell us how you have cut sugar down in your diet. Tell us what things you've benefited from by cutting sugar out of your diet. Message us if you have any suggestions or tips that would help your Live in the Dream team that we can discuss on future episodes. I will be right here with you, working on making us stronger, happier, and healthier humans. Until next time, friends, keep living the dream.